fifth graders, welcome back to our TV classroom. New week. New week. And you know what I realized last week? We did not introduce our fifth graders to these creatures up here, and they might be wondering who they are. <laughs> so fifth graders, before we even check in with our zones, I thought I would introduce you to these stuffed animals and why they're here. So in kindergarten through second grade, we have a phonics curriculum. Now, <laughs> Gus has to sit over on the bookshelf <laughs> because Gus is green and we use a green screen and so you wouldn't be able to see Gus. He camouflages in with the background. It's kind of funny. Poor Gus. Poor Gus. So we have Mabel, who's the elephant, Rashid, who's the lion, and then Gus. And then we were doing third grade students as well. So Ms. Gomez, she's at Roosevelt. Roosevelt. She's the coach there now, but she brought us Rafa for third grade. And what we were doing is having them be a talking buddy for students at home. Then we also have Pebble around here somewhere. I don't know where he went. He's a rock. And that was so that when we ask you to turn and talk, if there's no one around to turn and talk with, like turn and talk with your little learning buddy. And I had a pet rock named Pebble and it was great. And then mm -hmm. this is Chili, who you met during the SEL lessons. Mm -hmm. But that's who those animals are. That's why they're there. And that's so, why we talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> you might notice we talk to them every once in a while and it's just kind of because we're modeling how to mm -hmm. have a conversation because when you're learning, it's so important to actually say it. Mm -hmm. So, all right, I just have to get idea. that out. Yep. No, I'm yep. glad we did all that. All right, so now let's check in with our zones. Hmm, how are we feeling today? What's your brain doing? Like, are your thoughts calm? Are they fast? Are they worried? What kind of thoughts are you having? How's your body feeling? Is it tense or relaxed or kind of sluggish? And what are your emotions feeling like? Teachers, what's mm -hmm. your zone today? I think we were just talking about this, that I'm in the green zone. I am too. I slept well. Like I had one of those nights where I, I went to sleep and when I woke up in the morning, I, was, I think I was in the same position. I don't think I oh, moved I at all. I did not sleep that well. Oh, you didn't sleep that well. That sounds lovely. It was really nice. And then I had a good breakfast and mm -hmm. plenty of coffee. And I had some good laughs with my TV classroom buddies. Mm -hmm. How are you, Mrs. Wally? You know, I'm in the green zone too. I definitely good. didn't. I slept, I woke up a few times last oh. night, but I'm, I'm feeling good. Good. I'm a little tired today, yeah. but not, not nothing that would put me in the blue zone. Okay. And I'm excited for our lessons today. Yeah. Mr. Kevin, what zone are you in today? Well, thank you for asking teachers. I am also in the green zone. Uh, it's a kind of a nice day and, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, we're just happy to be here, happy yeah. to be able to uh, teach all of you wonderful kiddos out there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you look behind us, that's the weather right now out there. And it's definitely blue sky. It looks so. kind of hazy. There was a lot of fog this morning. There but, was. But now it looks nice. You know, I didn't have any fog at my house this morning. You had snow yesterday. I had snow yesterday <laughs> at my house. I came, I drove in here to the district office and I was the only car <laughs> with snow on it. It was really bizarre, friends. It was crazy. <laughs> it was just this one little pocket in Tacoma that got accumulating snow <laughs> right at my house. I woke up and looked outside and said, hang on a second, there's snow on my car. <laughs> oh, well, in March. Weird weather day, <laughs> weird weather week. All right, shall we start with our personal standards? Let's. I wonder yes. if you remember them, fifth graders. What do we do as scientists in our science classroom so we all mm -hmm. feel safe? Mm -hmm. We show, show respect, respect bing, make, make good, good decisions, decisions bing, and solve, solve problems. problems. Bing. Now, it's okay if you giggle a little at me and Miss Oslin. A little bit. Yeah, that's all right. We tend to make mistakes sometimes. Mm -hmm. And we get kind of silly. We do, it's fun. Yeah. So. What are we going to do today, Ms. Oslin? We're going to look back at our the beginning of our study of the Salish Sea. Oh, wow. We're going to start with a really neat video. And I'm going to get us there. Yeah, it's kind of tricky to get it up on the screen, but we it problem is. solved it. And I think we figured it out. I uh, do this, and then I do this, uh -huh. and then I do this. Uh huh. I'm going through all the steps. Yep. There it uh, is. And then, yep. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, back, hit back. What happened? What if I just go like that? There we go. Phew. Okay, Mr. Kevin, you can bring it up. Ready? Okay. Yes. So we want you to make observations on this. What do you think is happening? And why do you think it's happening? 
And what is happening? What is happening? Hmm. Hmm. Mr. Kevin, what do you see? I see some seabirds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can't identify the fish that are bobbing up and down uh, because it's a little small. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it looks like some fish are maybe feeding mm. because they're breaching out of the water. and. So we can tell you these are humpback whales. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's called bubble feeding. Bubble feeding? Huh. I wonder why they're doing that. Why do you think they're doing that? Hmm. Hmm. I wonder what they're having dependence on in that water. Oh. And why the birds are also I there. I was just gonna say that. I wonder how it's all connected. So we know that the humpback whales are eating something, mm -hmm. but why are the birds there? Like they're flocking in. Right? I wonder if the humpback whales and the birds have a similar food source. Oh, they work together? And maybe those bubbles like bring up that food source to the surface. Oh. Like if I think about force of Yeah, bubble, like the bubbling. Mm -hmm, might bring them up. Something to think about. Yeah, I don't know. The thing about these phenomena that we're gonna do is that we aren't always gonna have an answer. That's hard. It's hard, but you can research an answer. Mm -hmm. You can take a look and try to find an answer. And that's a good thing to do. So we're kind of doing them so that you start to wonder and start to on your own go, I'm gonna figure out what that humpback bubble feeding is. Mm -hmm. And you can do some of your own research mm -hmm. and get some knowledge that way. Yeah. Yeah. So last week we started this question and we're mm -hmm. gonna kind of end this question today, which mm -hmm. is why are the zones of the ocean important? Mm -hmm. Specifically, we've been talking about the tidal zone and the Salish Sea. Yes, and we went and saw we the did. high tide zone. We did see the high tide zone. We were bummed because it wasn't a low tide, Yeah. but we're waiting to see if we can get into mm -hmm. a low tide. But mm -hmm. for now, we saw the high tide and we saw limpets. We did. It was a limpet, I know for sure. Yep, we did some research. And we saw the periwinkles mm -hmm. and we saw the barnacles. Yep. So we saw the, the high tide zone animals. Mm -hmm. We did. We just didn't see the chitons. We didn't. We didn't see any chitons, mm -mm. but that's okay. So, should we review our big science oh, words? I was hoping he would jump in. I know. Mr. Well. <laughs> yes, I will jump right in. <laughs> <laughs> big science word. <laughs> I think we caught Mr. Kevin unawares. <laughs> I think we did, and that's okay. I was eating an egg. Oh, oh. sorry, Mr. Kevin. It's important to nourish your body it and your brain. It is important to nourish your body and your brain. So big science words. We did interdependent, which was when, when two, two or more animals, animals or things need each, each other. other. Do you remember that? So anytime we say interdependent, we say when interdependent two, <laughs> when two, two or more things, it, things need, need each, each other. other. Right? Yeah. Today, so, go ahead. I was just going to say we're going to learn a new word. We're going to learn two new words two today. Two new words today? Yeah. What's the first one? Intertidal zone. Intertidal zone. Hmm. What do you think intertidal zone means? Hmm. Well, we kind of know what a tidal zone is. Mm -hmm. It's like that top zone. Right. But what's intertidal? Well, I was making the connection between intertidal zone and interdependent. Oh. Which is when two or more things need each other. And that inter is the, the prefix. Oh, so maybe it's like all these different zones of the tidal zone and how they all need each other. Like you see the chitons and the, the periwinkles mm -hmm. and the barnacles, like mm -hmm. all kind of like in all the zones. Yeah, kind of how, maybe how they overlap mm -hmm. or, you know, like some, we saw periwinkles and limpets in both the spray zone and the high tide zone. Yeah, maybe. 
So maybe it means like between the tides or... Oh, it could. Yes, Mr. Kevin? I, I was just gonna say, are the, are the animals in each of the tidal zones uh, interdependent? Is that what they mean? Oh. Like, you know, interdependent? Like the zones are interdependent on each other on to each survive? On each other, or, yeah, right, to, oh, to thrive. Like mm -hmm. the, the spray zone needs the high tide zone, which needs the middle zone and the lowest tide zone? To mm -hmm. kind of all it's survive all and it's all connected? Between tides? Between tides. Hmm. The final meaning of the intertidal zone is the shore area exposed between high tide and low tide. So that means when it's at its lowest tide, it's the, all the stuff that's exposed? Yes. So like if it's here at lowest tide, mm -hmm. we're gonna see things like sea stars and crabs mm -hmm. and barnacles and mm -hmm. chitons and limpets and mussels and like, all like sea cucumbers and all these cool creatures. Yeah. Now I wonder if they're t if what about tide pools? Do those count? I don't know. I would think so because it's the shore area yeah, and exposed. it's exposed, even though there's water over it. Even though there's water because the it. tide is yeah, down. I think so. So I wonder if we would see some of this stuff in those tidal. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, tidal. the intertidal zone. Yeah. Huh. Here's a sentence. At low tide, there is little to no food for intertidal invertebrates. Oh. At low tide. At low tide. There is little to no food for intertidal invertebrates. Like, like a hermit, hermit crab, crab or a limpet or a sea star. Huh. Like, think about that sea star at low tide mm -hmm. and there's none, none of those little organisms mm -hmm. for it to eat because mm -hmm. the tide's out. The tide's out, yeah. So I wonder if they feel really, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Vulnerable when the tide oh. goes out. Because they don't have a food source. And I'm wondering if when we go mm -hmm. to a low tide, mm -hmm. if we need to be really careful because they're kind of in a really vulnerable spot. Like That's imagine if all of a thinking. sudden, like, your home was picked up and moved. Yeah. And you were just standing there. Ooh. That would feel weird, wouldn't that it? That would feel weird. Yes, Mr. Kevin? I was just thinking, uh, you know, thinking back to our field trip. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And we were on the seawall. Yeah. And y you were, you were uh, showing us some animals who lived on the seawall. They're fixed. They can't move. Yeah. The tide goes out, and there goes their food source. So... When the tide comes back in, oh, now I've got food. And maybe mm -hmm. they can move again. And maybe yeah. that's when they move is when that tide comes back in. Like I'm thinking, especially about those limpets, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how they like suck into the wall. And like when we touch them, they sucked in. I bet they didn't feel very good. Yeah. Sorry, limpets. Sorry. It was a really cool thing though, it that was. it did. It was. Yeah. What's our next word? Habitat. Hmm. We've word, used this word a lot in school, habitat. We have. What is a habitat, friends? Hmm. Well, I think about like my habitat is my home, mm -hmm. like the place I actually the live. The place you live. And I like live in a community, mm -hmm. but my habitat is inside my house. That's mm -hmm. where I eat and sleep mm -hmm. and do all the things I do to live. Mm -hmm. So a habitat might be a, a home. home. So it's the environment that a plant or animal lives or survives and grows. Yeah, their natural environment. Right, so kind of like where they normally go. Yeah. Now I'm thinking about some of these creatures here in the tidal zone, how they move between zones. They do. And I'm wondering if that changes their habitat. Like is this habitat up here on the northern part of the tidal zone, up top, mm -hmm. different than this habitat, or is it all the same Or is habitat? it all one habitat? Or like if you think about the ocean. Oh. There's like different. The ocean is huge. It's in different zones, right? There's just right. open water zone. That's a very different habitat than, than down here zones. in the tidal zone. Yes. You don't just see sea stars like floating around in mm -mm. the middle of the ocean. Mm -mm. Hmm. Hmm. There's some thinking. Yeah. So our sentence is, the Salish Sea is the habitat of whales, orcas, and salmon. Yeah. 
I don't so, see orcas very often in the tidal zone. No. That would probably not be a good thing, right? Right. I mean, it depends on how far the tide is in. Sometimes yeah. you'll see them come close, but they don't, like, live there. They just yeah. visit there. Yeah, they just visit. Huh. huh. Some things to think about, fifth graders. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking about that? What do you think about the difference between this idea of habitat mm -hmm. and then, like, almost like ecosystem? Yes. Right? Hmm. Jot down a few thoughts that you're having or share with someone next to you. Or if you have a learning buddy, yeah. you can practice turning and talking. Miss Oslin's my learning buddy. You can practice talking to like a Rafa or a Rashid. Mm -hmm. How do you think they're all connected? Well, I think, I think like you said, like with the orcas, like they come in close, but they don't go into the tidal zones. And the, the creatures, the plants and animals that we see in the tidal zones, we don't see out in the open ocean. Right. So I think they're different habitats. But they're interdependent. They are. Interdependent when two, two or, or more, more things, things meet each, each other. other. Interesting. Very interesting. We've been kind of reviewing this input chart, haven't we? We have been. So we've been looking at like all these different zones and talking about how all these different creatures, it's okay, Mr. Kevin, <laughs> all these different creatures kind of rely on each they other, do. right? Yes. Like I think about the hermit crabs and the periwinkles, like the periwinkles we saw up here mm -hmm. when we were on that, the bulkhead for mm -hmm. the highest tide zone. We did. They were so tiny. They were so small. But I'm very curious if as we go lower in the tidal zones, if the periwinkles get larger. Oh. I'm curious about that. I don't know. I really don't know. And that's something I want to kind of find mm -hmm. out. And like, do the hermit crabs use periwinkle shells? Or do they use a different kind of shell? That would be a very, because the periwinkles were really small. Tiny. So tiny, you almost couldn't even see them on the so video. So it would have to be a really small crab. Right. And I don't think hermit crabs are that small. But do they, so. are there bigger periwinkles? That then the hermit crabs mm -hmm. would use those bigger periwinkles. Mm-hmm. Oh. There's and then as thinking. those ones grow, they leave and the mm -hmm. crab comes in mm -hmm. and takes over the shell. Mm -hmm. And then how does all of this relate to like salmon and orcas and these things that live out in the more open water? Yes. Do they have a food source here? Yeah. Things to think about, friends. Lots to th I have lots of questions. I have a lot of, and that's what scientists do. Mm -hmm. They make observations mm -hmm. that then spark questions, that then spark research and investigations. Mm -hmm. So, always open to changing our thinking too, right? Always. And uh, so that's something I encourage you to do, fifth graders, is as we're talking about this stuff, you're not just sitting there getting input. Mm -hmm. We want you to also be think, jotting down ideas that you want to take further because that's what being a scientist is. Mm -hmm. We can only spark the imagination mm -hmm. so much. You have to choose to then on your free time go, oh, I'm really curious. I think I'm going to go down there on a mm -hmm. low tide and see if there's... Right, and go with your family and go yeah. explore or do some research on the computer. You mm -hmm. know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Then you have some great knowledge for all your writing projects you have to do oh, too. Yeah. See right. if there's any other creatures that you see that aren't on our input chart. Right. Because I was thinking about like, I've seen when I've gone to Point Defiance uh, before, I've seen jellyfish. We didn't right. see any jellyfish. We didn't see any jellyfish. And there aren't any jellyfish on here. Mm -mm. So it makes me wonder, are they part of the tidal zone or are they part of a different zone? Oh. Do they just visit the tidal zone and then drift yeah. back out? And are they part of the interdependence? Maybe. Interdependence when two, two or more, more things need each, each other. other. Okay, let's get into our book. Yes, so many of you have this at home. Um, it's a book that a lot of students got. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have it, that's okay. We have the pages up here for you to read. But we're gonna kind of look through it and read. And we're just gonna do this one chapter. So on one side of this, you, you don't have this picture page, do you? Mm -hmm. On one side, there's this beautiful, this beautiful picture of a bunch of sea stars. Um, and it says, life at the edges, the intertidal world. Oh, there's that word. Intertidal. Intertidal. Oh, now you can see it. Look at that. Do you see it? Isn't that great? And we learned that intertidal is the area, the shore exposed when it's between exposed. a high tide and a low tide. Right, and so this looks like it's probably mm -hmm. a low tide area. And this is one of those tidal pools that's been exposed. Mm -hmm. It's really beautiful, all the it colors. It really is. 
And then over here, there's a picture of a guy kayaking or a gal I can't tell. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and read. Yeah. And then stop me whenever you feel we need to have a conversation. Let's look at the title of the chapter. Okay. So the chapter is called Life at the Edges, the Intertidal World. And the author intentionally chose that chapter. Yes. What do we think we're going to learn about in this chapter? And how does the chapter title help us predict? And kind of understand the main topic of the chapter. Yeah. Hmm. I love that they use life at the edges. It's really a good hook, right? Right. Like I'm thinking about like I'm, the edge of the water. Yeah. I'm interested. And like there's life even at the tippy tippy mm -hmm. edge. Mm -hmm. Different types of lives. Yeah. Too. Plants and animals. Right. Okay, okay, let's go. Yeah. Along the edges of the Salish Sea, plants and animals have adapted to life where sea level is constantly rising or falling. The shore area exposed between high tide and low tide is called the intertidal zone. The twice daily ebb or outflow of water, ooh, that's a good vocabulary word, ebb, that's outflow. when the water goes out for low tide, and flood or inflow of water, of the tides shape the rhythm of life in this narrow band of shoreline. The oxygen that most marine animals need to survive is dissolved in seawater. So when the tide is out, they must keep their body tissues moist by burrowing into wet sand or mud or by seeking shelter beneath rocks and kelp. Now I'm thinking about mm. that wall. Yes. And there was kelp all over that wall and all those creatures were inside and underneath that kelp. Now we know why. To keep their bodies moist. To keep their bodies moist so they can breathe. So they rely on the kelp. They sure do. When the tide is out to keep their bodies moist until the tide comes back in. Interesting. At low tide, when there is little or no food available for intertidal invertebrates, they must alternate between periods of activity and, binding, and bidding their time until the flood tide delivers flood and oxygen with every incoming wave. For us and for other land animals that hunt for food, the intertidal zone, the coast Salish, have a saying. I didn't read that right. That didn't make sense. I'm going to go back and reread that. Great strategy. For us and for other land animals that hunt for food in the intertidal zone, important word, mm -hmm. the Coast Salish have a saying. When the tide is out, the table is set. When the tide is out, the table. Oh. Hmm. What do you think that means, friends? Why would they say the table is set when the tide is out? When the tide's out, this chapter was saying that the animals are kind of stuck where they are. Mm -hmm. they, don't have, they don't have access to food. And they don't have access to really move anywhere. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to stay moist. And they're trying to like just wait for that tide mm -hmm. to come. Which means if there's something tasty. Like the mussels. Or the crabs. Mm -hmm. Then we can go hunting for that food there and it will be easier to get than if we try and dive underwater to get it when mm -hmm. they have all of their oxygen and water and mm -hmm. things to eat. Mm -hmm. So the table is set like for dinner. Like yeah. food's ready, soup's on. Right, or think about like a bird who's looking for a crab. Oh. It's gonna be much easier to eat the crab when the tide's yep. out yep. and find it and hunt it yep. than when the tide's in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Easier to grab those clams and oysters, right? We saw the shells mm -hmm. that were up in the woods. We presumed that a bird had picked them up and then dropped them to open them up so that they could then eat them. Yeah, oh. so interesting. Now here's this little fact box. It says fast currents. When you place your finger partially over the end of a hose, a dribble of water becomes a fast moving spray. Like think about if you're playing outside with a hose, mm -hmm. you've got the water. And then I know I do this like when I'm trying to like water a bunch of plants, yes. I'll stick my thumb on the end and go and sprays the water. Mm -hmm. 
They push water through, uh, I missed a part. Tides act in the same way. They push water through narrow channels of land and force the water to speed up. These fast currents can reach speeds of 16 knots, which is 30 kilometers an hour, at Skookumchuk, yes, I said that right, narrows in British Columbia more than two times the top speed for most sailboats, which may frustrate those wishing to sail against the tide. For expert kayakers, strong tides create playgrounds of fast-moving water. So that's mm. what's going on. This is a kayaker who's playing in the, the tide currents. Mm -hmm. The flood, right? Mm -hmm. the yeah, the flood. flood, or it could be the flood or, or the, the, ebb. the ebb. Yeah, my mom is from Australia, and she talks a lot about the currents and how that ebb and flow can be a, when the tides are changing, mm -hmm. that that's a really dangerous time where she grew up on the beach to mm -hmm. be out in the water because what can happen is you can get stuck in a tide current and pull you out. And in fact, do we have time for a story? Sure, of course. This is about a tide current. Okay. So when I was in fifth grade, your age, I went with my grandma to visit my family that lived in Australia. Mm -hmm. And I got to go up to my granddad's house for a week and he took me out on a boat and we were going snorkeling. And in Australia, every kid knows how to swim. Mm. I didn't know how to swim yet. But he didn't really understand that I didn't know how to swim. He thought that meant I just wasn't a very good swimmer. Mm. No, I didn't know how to swim. Oh, scary. And so he's like, oh, you're fine. You'll be with me snorkeling. So I, I get in and all of a sudden, the boat is getting further oh. and further and further away, and I'm clinging to my granddad, and we got stuck in a tidal current, and it pulled us out, and they had to get into the, the lifeboat and come and get us. Oh my goodness. Because we were stuck in the Great Barrier Reef in a tidal current being pulled out. Was it fast moving? <laughs> yes, it moved us very oh. quickly. Like wow. before we even realized what was happening, the boat was really far away. Oh, wow. So you have to know what's happening if you're playing in the water mm -hmm. with those currents because it can take you before you even realize what's happening. Scary. I'm glad you're okay. Me too. <laughs> but it's a story I will always remember about my mm -hmm. granddad and it was really scary. Mm -hmm. But it, I, can, I can attest that, yes, those currents are very, very fast. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool story, mm -hmm. huh? Tide, tides creators of the entire intertidal zone are controlled by the sun's and the moon's gravitational pulls on the earth. Can you read that one more time, mm -hmm. please? Tides, creators of the intertidal zone, mm -hmm. are controlled by the sun's and the moon's gravitational pulls on the earth. Huh. I wonder what that means. The sun and the moon. So the tides create the intertidal zone. Mm -hmm. That's the shore area that's exposed when between go, a high tide yep. and a low tide as the so water is. That part that the, yep. from like the highest tide point to the mm -hmm. lowest tide point, that in between spot. They're controlled by the sun's and the moon's gravitational pull. Oh. It's like the forces trade pull and that yes. pulls it in and out. Interesting. Along with the wind and the estuarine circulation mixing fresh water and salt water, they also push huge volumes of water through the sea, mixing nutrients and oxygen and carrying microscopic juvenile forms of fish and invertebrates called larvae from their birth sites. Powerful tidal currents can also force fish, like herring, to swim in certain directions and at times push boats and scuba divers in directions they may or may not want to go. I'm making a connection. What's your connection? I'm thinking about the interdependence when two or more things need each other mm -hmm. and the tides take those larvae, larva, from a tidal zone farther out mm -hmm. where they can grow and maybe get a different food source. Mm -hmm. So those larvae are dependent upon the tides to move them. Mm -hmm. And the tidal zones are talking about it like pushes the fish or the fish can help create some of that tidal mm -hmm. movement. So I wonder if that like, thinking back to that humpback whale bubbling. Yes. I wonder if that was a tide out or a tide in moment. Oh, was it ebbing or flooding? Just some thoughts in my head as I'm reading. The Salish Sea boasts many types of intertidal habitats. Habitat includes the community of animals and plants that live there and the physical conditions that determine how these species must adapt to survive. So okay. the place they actually live. Yeah. 
This includes the type of soil or rocks, plants, and the presence, absence, or intermittent presence of water. Common intertidal habitats you can find in the Salish Sea include tidal flats, rocky shorelines, and eelgrass. Oh. So where we were was a rocky shoreline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tidal flats are created when an ebbing tide leaves a flat area of sand or mud. From a distance, mud flats may look boring and without life. Take a closer look and you will see holes, mounds, and corkscrew-shaped piles that tell you that there is a whole different world beneath the surface. A great diversity of burrowing invertebrates and fish species use tidal flats as habitat during some portion of their life cycle. So back in Australia, mm -hmm. it's really interesting, the beach that my, my mom grew up on, her house, and then there was like sea, like grasses, mm -hmm. and then the beach. And every time you walk down to the beach during a low tide, it looks like someone has come and painted these beautiful swirling pictures oh. all over the sand. But when you get close, there are these little tiny balls of sand that little crabs have dug oh. down up and they create these beautiful patterns on the beach. Oh. And it's a flat area, right? Yes. It's just the compacted sand. It's amazing. I have some pictures, I'll bring them in. Yes, I'm curious to see those. Yeah, it's really beautiful. So I was totally making that connection. Yeah. They're like, yes, I know exactly what they're talking about. Yeah. I've seen that. It's really amazing and beautiful. And I'm looking at this picture and it looks like these birds are kind of um, eating mm -hmm. on the shoreline, like digging mm -hmm. down and like looking at their beak and thinking about like what you learn in second grade mm -hmm. about biodiversity mm -hmm. and in first grade about biomimicry and like mm -hmm. how they need that really long beak to be able to get down and get those crabs in those holes. You know what? I can think of how humans have mimicked these birds because I'm thinking about when I go clamming. Yeah. We use these big shoots oh. that we shove down in. It's a big pipe right, like a PVC pipe, and we shove it down, and that's how we get the clams out. And it's like Very that. Very similar to that beak. Yes. I think these are smaller clams, though. Probably a little bit smaller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so next time you visit a tidal flat, use your hand or a small trowel to dig into the mud and see what you can find. You might find burrowing mud shrimp, clams, oysters, snails, or crabs. Unless you use a microscope, you will not be able to see the tiny dilations or single-celled phytoplankton that cover the surface of mudflats and create nutrients, nutritious fuel for small migrating birds. This super smoothie is called biofilm. Biofilm. Mm -hmm. oh, like I'm thinking smoothie. about like at a beach where like the foam comes in there, mm. but that's just full of all of that. Yeah. It'd be cool to get a microscope and look underneath. Oh, and that see would be it. interesting. It would be really interesting. All right, ghostly shrimp and formidable gray whales. Hmm. While digging in a mud flat at low tide, you might find a ghoulish looking pink and white crustacean, the well-named ghost shrimp. These large shrimp may look frightening, but they're harmless. They spend their days digging along branching burrows in the mud, and when the tide comes in, filtering, ooh, I always say this word wrong, Detri det detritus. Detritus, thank you. Detritus, or dead organic material, mm -hmm. from the water, all while trying to avoid being eaten by a gray whale. <gasps> oh, food source. Mm-hmm. Tide, tidal zone, mm -hmm. then food source. So yep. I bet when that tide goes out, those go out with it and feed the gray mm -hmm. whales. The gray whale, which can be longer than a school bus, wow. is a formidable hunter of small invertebrates armed with a 2,500 pound or 1,100 kilogram tongue that can create suction and with baleen in its upper jaw for a filter. Hold on. 2,500 pound tongue? Longer than a school bus? Well, they're longer than a school bus, but their yeah. tongue, just their tongue weighs 2,500 pounds. I can't even imagine what, what that's, That's a, a lot. lot of pounds. That's, <laughs> That's a, a very, pounds. very heavy tongue. And it like glides through the water with such beauty. Yes. Wow. They're very graceful. So that tongue can create suction and with baleen in its upper jaw for a filter, it waits for the tide to come in over the mud, swims in, oh, I was wrong in my prediction, mm. scoops up, filters out and eats the ghost shrimp. Oh. So the tide comes in 
those ghost shrimp come out of the sand and the gray whales are waiting there by the tidal yes. flats to then like scoop up. They, so they scoop up all the water and the shrimp and then push the water out through their baleen, which is like <gasps> fibers. I wonder so it's if, like a toothbrush, right? I wonder if the humpback whales are similar. I wonder if that's what they're doing. They're coming up and they're scooping and then they're blowing up and making those bubbles. Oh. Maybe. Maybe. And that would explain why the birds are there too, right? If we know that all these shrimp are in the water. Yeah. Then the birds are One, take, taking advantage of that They want some dinner too. too. They do. So if you want to see a gray whale... Which kind of shoreline do you think you want to be near? Oh, a, a sandy one, right? Yeah, like a that's flat. Where the yeah, like a tidal flat. Tidal flat. Because that's where the shrimp burrow. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily in the rocky shoreline where the crabs and stuff are, mm -hmm. but more in those tidal flat areas. Mm -hmm. hmm. Ooh, that is a very interesting looking bird. Let's take a minute just to observe that bird. What do you notice? What do you see? have a wonder. What's your wondering? I'm noticing that they're, it's eating mussels mm -hmm. and those are all black. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that bird has such a bright beak so it can see where its beak is when oh. it's eating. Because if the beak was black, it might be really hard to tell where its beak is going mm -hmm. to be able to get the food. Like they can actually see the food. Yeah. I was wondering, I was trying to figure out the perspective because it looks like I, in my mind, I was thinking that that would be a small bird, but knowing how big mussels are, mm -hmm. and for that bird to be standing on so many mussels and for them to look so small, that must be a pretty large bird. Yeah, I think it is. Black oyster catchers often can be found walking along rocky shorelines where they use their sturdy, long red bills to eat limpets and mussels, mm -hmm. but not oysters. Oh. Perhaps it should have been named the black limpet catcher <laughs> or the black mussel eater. I wonder why it was I named that. I wonder why it was named an oyster catcher if it, it doesn't, doesn't eat oysters. That's a really interesting thing to think about. Yeah. Exposed rock, low growing kelp, strong currents, and extreme tidal action characterize rocky shorelines. Another intertidal habitat. At low tide, these are great locations to search for intertidal invertebrates, especially in tide pools, mm. which are small pools of water that remain at low tide. High in the intertidal zone, you may find tiny barnacles escaping predation by crabs and sea stars. Lower in the zone, you'll find multiple species of crabs, sea stars, limpets, anemones, worms, and even small eel-shaped fish. And that's what we were hoping to see mm -hmm. when we went. Mm -hmm. But we definitely saw the barnacles and limpets like yes. hanging out up top yes, trying to avoid. Kelp. And now we know why the kelp now is there. Now we know why. Eelgrass is a plant that creates another type of intertidal habitat that resembles an undersea prairie. Its slender algae-coated leaves offer places where fish, crabs, and other invert... I lost my breath. Other invertebrates can live, feed, and hide. Some fish species live in eelgrass meadows only when they are young. Mm. Others live there as adults, too. Huge pools of Pacific herring use these meadows for spawning or laying their eggs on the eelgrass. When the young hatch, they're in a relatively safe place to begin growing up. It's relatively safe because eelgrass not only supports the creatures that live in the meadows, but also provides feeding grounds for the fish, birds, and mammals that come there to hunt. Mm -hmm. So it's somewhat safe. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a little um, caption for the, this picture. Many species of blood stars on the top can be found intertidally through the Salish Sea, even in or near, near eelgrass meadows. Unlike the blood star, which stands out, 
The bay pipefish on the bottom is an excellent mimic of the eelgrass in which it lives. Oh. Biomimicry. Biomimicry. It is colored, shaped, and moves with the current like eelgrass. Camouflage helps fish hide from predators and at times from the animals they are hunting. So not only does it help it keep it safe, it also helps it hunt for its food. That is interesting. Really interesting. They are really interconnected. I would love to see one of these in yes, person. That would be really interesting. And these blood sea stars are so bright and beautiful. Mm -hmm. Shoreline predators. Ooh, this is exciting. Uh-huh. I'm gonna read the caption and then I'll read the part on the right. The shorelines of the Salish Sea are a rich buffet of kelp, fish, and invertebrates for birds and land-based mammals like this mink. Ah, it's a mink. We were wondering, we saw it on our observation chart. We were wondering yes, what that creature was. That's a mink. Oh, I didn't know I we didn't had, know we had mink around here. Around here. I, Mr. Kevin, did you know we had minks? The only minks I know of were unfortunately on the backs of wealthy people. Mm. Yeah, I guess mm -hmm. we have some minks. I would love to see one. Yes. As you explore, you may also see crows, belted kingfishers, and a variety of gulls, as well as river otters on the top. Raccoons, black-tailed deer, and maybe even a black bear. Oh. Mm -hmm. Like I think up in Alaska, I've seen mm -hmm. bears along the mm -hmm. coastal shorelines. Mm -hmm. We saw evidence of deer. We sure did. On our field trip. We did. Mission intertidal. On the right, so I don't know if we want to switch to the next picture while I read. Yep. So, you can be an intertidal explorer. Find a field guide for the seashore and a tide table for your local beach and go. When you arrive, you might not notice anything. Wait and watch. You'll begin to see fish and crabs moving in tide pools. Gently turn over rocks smaller than your hand, any larger and you might kill animals hiding below, and look for creatures hiding beneath or clinging to the bottom of the rock. Be gentle as you look for tidal creatures. They have to first survive some extremely difficult living conditions. In the Salish Sea, the lowest daytime tides occur in the hottest summer months, and the lowest nighttime tides are in the coldest winter months. This means intertidal animals have to survive being exposed on the year's hottest days and the coldest nights. When you find something, your first task is to identify it by name. Then learn how it lives, what it eats, who it might eat, how it moves, and how much it survives being exposed to such extreme conditions. To be sure the creatures survive, gently return the rock mm. to its original position when you're done exploring. We did that when we were out. Yep. We made sure anything that we moved at Point Defiance, we put back right where we found it mm -hmm. and we didn't pick up things that were much bigger than our hand. Mm -hmm. I like that rule of thumb because we're always gonna, I'm always gonna have my hand with me, right? Right, it's a really good rule. That if it's smaller than my, than my hand, I can move it, but I have to put it back. Look at all of the muscles there that are attached mm -hmm. to what looks like a rock. That's all muscles you see behind the, the children there. Mm -hmm. And then in the pool, you can see all the sea anemones mm -hmm. and the sea stars. It looks like a, some crabs or some clams. It's pretty amazing. I hope that we get to go down during a low tide. Yes. It would be really fun. All right, friends. There's a last picture. Look at that. This is going into the next chapter, which Ooh. is Life in the Deep, the Subtitle World. Oh. You, if you have this book, you might go investigate it. Yes. That's a very interesting looking creature. Very, very bright. Mm hmm With a bright background. It yeah. looks kind of like a slug. It kind of does. Like it has the foot of a slug on mm -hmm. the bottom, and the, but then it has this weird, I'm not sure what those are. I'm I might have to read to find mm -hmm. out. Mm hmm All right, friends. What an amazing book with amazing information in it. Yes, that whole chapter was all about that intertidal Just zone. I learned so much. so much. I hope you learned something from reading that with us too. And I'm wondering, did it spark your imagination or your wonder at all? Did you get curious about something? Is there anything you're curious about? Did you jot down anything that you were like, ooh, I want to look at that more? Mm -hmm. hmm. I want to learn more about the minks. I'm very curious about the minks. I was also curious about, let me go back to it. This bird, the one with the orange beak. 
with the muscles. Mm -hmm. I'm very curious how big that bird is. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to learn more about why it's called an oyster catcher when yes. it doesn't catch oysters. It doesn't catch oysters. Yes, Mr. Kevin? His, the bird's legs look a little stocky like a chicken. Almost. They really they do. do. Like it, yeah, it looks like it could almost be the size of a chicken, which is crazy to me. Mm -hmm. So I've got to go find where there's lots of mussels and mm -hmm. be watching for that bird. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Oh, it's time for a chant. Yes. We've been sitting and reading for a while. We so have been. If it's comfortable for you and you're able, feel free to stand oh, up. Oh yes, move your body do. a little. As pretty we soon, do we're going to have some do tables that we can stand up with. Yes, which will I'm be excited great. for that. Okay, do you want to be green or blue? I'll be green this time. Okay. Or I'll be, I think it's blue and yellow, so I'll be blue, the top okay. line. I'll start. Okay, go ahead. Okay. We all know because we've been told. Energy is worth its weight in gold. Energy passes to organ, energy passes to organisms thrive. Living things need energy to survive. <laughs> Sound off energy. energy. Sound off. Food chain, one, two, three, four, for, for survival. Plants get their energy from the sun. Plants are producers, everyone. Light, water, air make the food they store. Producers make food, who could ask for more? Sound off, energy. energy. Sound off, food chain, one, one two, two, three, three four. four. For, for survival. survival. Now that's interesting because if you think about what they were saying here in the book, think about that eelgrass, mm -hmm. how it was most definitely a producer. Yes. And like not only a producer, but a protector. Yes. Really interesting that these plants in our world are so important to sustaining life here on earth. Mm -hmm. And our, the animals are really interdependent. Oh yeah. Interdependent when, when two, two or, or more, more things, things need, need each, each other. other. Imagine what would happen if we didn't have plants. Well, then we wouldn't have the fish. We wouldn't, would we? Primary consumers are herbivores. They eat the producers and food they've stored. Plants to consumers, the energy is passed. To help reproduction of living things last. Sound off energy. energy. Sound off food chain. One, two, three. Four, for survival. Oh, this is a long chant. Mm -hmm. Secondary consumers will benefit too. Eating primary consumers is what they do. The energy passes down the food chain. And circle of life is then sustained. Sound off. Energy. Sound off. Food chain. One, two, three, four. For, for survival. survival. Like I think about, like I'm thinking about that chant and how that applies to this intertidal world. Mm -hmm. And how that chapter was talking about how all of these things are interdependent on each other. Mm -hmm. There's the things that are eating the kelp and that then the secondary predators are then eating yes. those primary consumers. Yes. Like, oh, it's so amazing. It is. So fifth graders, you're gonna get back into your science notebook. And mm -hmm. last lesson, you started this chart, an inquiry chart, thinking about what you know, and that says vibration. We're not learning about vibration. Oops. Whoopsie doops. We're learning about <laughs> interdependence. So I want you to take some time to think about what you think you know about interdependence, the mm -hmm. intertidal zone, and habitats of the Salish Sea. And think more about what you want to learn about what those. Are, what we've learned. What too. you have learned. Like, what did you want to learn and what have you learned about yes. these tidal zones? What like, questions were answered? Yeah, did you answer any questions? Did you, do you have more questions? Like, oh. you had questions and you answered some, but now it brought up more questions. That's mm -hmm. what scientists do. It is. And write down some of those things for us. Was there anything that challenged your thinking? Ooh. That's when we learn the most. It really is. Is when we reflect on what we thought we knew, and now we're like, oh, I now I know differently. I mm -hmm. think I know differently. Right. You're also going to continue writing about why are the zones of the ocean important? We learned a lot today about that. You have a lot of information. And if you didn't catch it all, you know what's great about TV Classroom? Rewatch. You can rewatch part of it as you're writing mm -hmm. or have it playing in the background. So as you're writing and things pop up and you can write it mm -hmm. down. That's a good strategy. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna write, you know you're successful with your writing today when you write three or more paragraphs explaining why the intertidal zone of the ocean is important for the Salish Sea. 
why is this shoreline so, so important, important for the entire Salish Sea? Why is this one habitat mm -hmm. important for the entire Salish Sea? Mm -hmm. I think you have a lot of information to write. Absolutely. I think you can for sure get three paragraphs down. Definitely. Yeah. And of course, we would love for you to send us your writing here mm -hmm. to our TV mm -hmm. classroom. And like we said, when you send us your work, your name goes into a drawing. To win this input chart. You and we've it. autographed the bat. We did, we signed it. And we will put it through the laminator so it's a nice poster mm -hmm. for you. And you will always remember your learning of the intertidal zones. Here at TV Classroom. Yep. Mr. Kevin, how can our fifth graders send us their work? Sure, just uh, go to your email machine and type in TV Classroom at tacoma.k12.wa.us. You can also mail something to us at the TV Classroom headquarters here, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Kevin. Now it's time for my favorite part of our lesson. Affirmation time. Affirmation. We get to say positive things about ourselves before we go off to do our independent work. Today, our affirmation is, I can change my thinking. Because I had, I did not know we had minks. Now I know. I thought uh, I knew that we didn't. I, me too. I, I had definitely, to change that. Mm -hmm. That's why I had no idea what that creature was last week. Yes. Mm -hmm. So fifth graders, let's all take a breath together and say our affirmation. I, I can change, change my thinking. thinking. Excellent job today, fifth graders. We hope you have a great rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you back here next time in our TV classroom. Bye friends. <laughs>